Today's episode of the Dad Chronicle is brought to you by Peak Tea. Peak has an incredible selection of teas that support a healthy immune system, healthy digestion, calm energy, and healthy weight management. The matcha is incredible. It's a great coffee alternative with sustained energy to get you through those hectic days. And also, it's crafted by a Japanese tea master. There are only 15 of them in the world. Get your tea at peaktea.com. That's spelled P-I-Q-U-E-T-E-A dot com. And use code AlexA5 at checkout to get 5% off your order. Again, that's spelled P-I-Q-U-E-T-E-A dot com. And use code AlexA5 at checkout. Welcome back to The Dad Chronicle, where we share stories from dads all around the world. I'm your host, Alex Albisu. This is episode 137. On today's episode, I invite a familiar face back to the show. It's Sam Ahn. You might recognize Sam from our conversation on episode 99, where we talk about losing a child. And while Sam's story of losing his two children is extremely tragic, he and his wife, Elaine, have an incredible story to share, and I can't wait for you guys to hear this one. We talk about Sam and Elaine's decision to adopt after the loss of their two children. And our thinking is that, you know, we are we are parents without live children. And there are children out there who don't have parents. And, you know, for us, it almost seems natural that, you know, that pairing should happen. We talk about the adoption process when adopting internationally in their case from South Korea. So it really is a test of your kind of um, emotional and mental uh, resilience, really, uh, when you're when you're adopting internationally. And finally, we talk about meeting their son for the first time and what life is like in the on household. I don't know how to describe it other than saying that it felt right. Here's my conversation with Sam on Sam on. Welcome back to the Dad Chronicle. How are you, my hey, friend? I'm doing great. It's so great to be back. Um, you know, I love this show. I love to stay in, in contact with you and just hearing about the stories of different dads. So Uh, I'm really excited to be back today. Yeah, and last time that you were here, it was with Jeff Blau, uh, Mm -hmm. episode 99, in fact. Wow. Uh, Back in March of 2020. That is forever ago. I can't believe, wow. Yeah, and and we'll talk a little bit about that episode and what we talked about there. But first of all, let's reintroduce you to the friends at home. All right. Uh, Hi, all. My name's Sam. Uh, I am married to a wonderful woman named Elaine. Um, and we recently adopted a child from South Korea and, uh, that's what I'm here to talk about today. So exciting, dude. Yeah. So exciting. It's, it's been great. <laughs> and, and let's, let's talk about your son for just a moment. You know, um, mm-hmm. I've talked sure. to a lot of dads on the show who have different philosophies around how we, uh, you know, talk about our kids on the internet and some other things mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. Talk to us about, uh, your all's decision for anonymity around your, your son and, uh, as you brought him home. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, for people who follow us, my wife and myself on social media, uh, we've never posted his face uh, fully on social media. Uh, The reason being, you know, my wife is in um, public relations marketing and I am in social media kind of marketing and that that kind of industry. So we kind of both know how... um, how important it is to maintain some modicum of, you know, giving people a choice um, to really protect their identities, uh, you know, out, out there on the internet. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that, you know, his digital footprint is as small as possible until he is of age and can make the decisions himself um, in terms of how to uh, be, you know, on the, on the internet. So for now, like, you know, we, we like to refer to him as baby on, uh, on social media. Uh, you know, those closest to us will have, uh, learned his name, but, uh, we generally like to keep, uh, from sharing his name online, uh, in public. So yeah, we'll talk about baby on today. It's gonna be yeah, great. And it's such a great opportunity to, to talk about him, especially everything that you guys have been through back in episode mm-hmm. 99. We talked a lot about <laughs> that, but let's revisit it just very briefly sure. yours and Elaine's experience sure. and story up to this point. 
Yeah, so uh, my wife and I, we met back in 2008. Um, so we dated for a while before we got married in uh, 2015. We really enjoyed the married couple life for a couple of years. And then we decided that we wanted to start trying to uh, grow our family. Um, so in 2017, uh, we got pregnant for the first time. And up until up until it wasn't, it was uh, a pretty normal pregnancy without any major complications. Uh, until uh, the 18th week of our pregnancy when we had a, um, a spontaneous uh, rupture of the membranes, which means uh, basically uh, we weren't able to carry uh, Francis, that was his name, um, to term. And uh, we we lost uh, Francis because of uh, what we d- eventually determined the doctors call a an insufficient cervix, which means that... Um, Elaine's uterus could not uh, physically support uh, a pregnancy without uh, additional help. So, you know, when we lost Francis, we we learned and we figured that, you know, that was kind of the way that the silver lining was that Francis allowed us to understand and know that there was an issue. Um, so when we decided to try again, um, we got pregnant again right away. This time, you know, we went in for uh, what's called a cerclage, which helps um, kind of reinforce the cervix. So yeah, again, you know, everything was fine, even up to the cerclage. And then uh, a couple weeks after the cerclage, you know, it seemed to be holding for a while. And then we found that it, uh, the cervix was also, again, still having trouble. Um, so they went in to revise, revise the cerclage, and, uh, you know, we were hoping that it would hold. Um, but, you know, around week 24, um, it was determined that it wasn't holding. So uh, we actually had to, uh, Elaine had to check into the hospital, and she was on hospital bed rest for a week, but then... Uh, we had to have an emergency C-section because baby, our second baby, uh, Zoe, decided to uh, come into the world very early. Um, and she did great. She was in the NICU at um, at the hospital for a good 47 days. She was growing. She was healthy. She had a couple of um, infections here and there that were cleared up. But then um, one night... Uh, August 13th, uh, it's the call you never want to receive. And uh, we rushed to the hospital. She was having trouble breathing, and they were having trouble um, with her heart rate. And uh, by the time we got to the hospital, it was pretty much too late. And uh, that's the day we lost our second child, uh, Zoe. Um, So it was determined that, you know, there were some additional measures intervention that could have been done had we wanted to get uh pregnant naturally again um but you know it didn't come without any you know it came with it came with a lot of complications and risks and you know we don't want to risk the loss of another uh child and we don't want to risk uh, another kind of traumatic uh, pregnancy and traumatic delivery. So uh, we decided at that point that uh, the way to grow our family was going to be through adoption. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's interesting because, you know, Elaine and I, even before we met, you know, I've always wanted adoption to be part of my family story when I got older. And this was like back when I was probably in middle school or elementary school, uh, much younger. Um, I just, you know, always wanted, you know, one biological child at least, and then uh, one or two adopted kids because I just thought that, you know, that was a natural way because I had a lot of friends who were also adopted. Um, and apparently, uh, Elaine also had that you know, when she was growing up. She also has family members who are adopted. So, you know, adoption has kind of both has been part of both of our uh, approaches to how we would eventually have a family. And, you know, before we got married, we were talking and we found that, you know, that was one thing that we we both shared in common in terms of how we would want to eventually grow our family. Uh, you know, and our thinking is that, you know, we are we are parents without live children and there are children out there who don't have parents. And, you know, for us, it almost seems natural that, you yeah. know, that pairing should happen. Yeah. Yeah. And was that a hard decision for you guys to come to? to adopt did you guys have any hurdles uh that you overcame or was it a was it fairly seamless in your in your decision after some of the losses that you had had experienced 
uh, was it was it easier to make that decision at that point? Um, I wouldn't say it was easier. It just uh, you know we were always going to adopt our next kid. Right. Um, you know, had either Francis or Zoe uh, made it to term and you know stayed alive. So you know that wasn't really that hard of a decision to make, and mm-hmm. um, because we were so we were both so committed to the idea of adoption, yeah. um, it it almost was like it seemed like it was the meant it was meant to be, um, considering just it's it's been part of you know how we approached you know family uh, yeah. even from the beginning of our life. So uh, you know for us it it didn't seem like it, there would be any hurdles. Um, emotionally well you, you guys uh, are both uh, just and and i've told you this before but you guys are incredible like the first of all the dedication to what you guys have been through mm-hmm. um the the dedication to each other the tenacity the, the focus on on love for your children all three of them um mm-hmm. is inspiring and and so so thank you very much for for, for sharing that perspective and, and, sure. and for everybody listening if you'd like to hear a little bit more about some of the more in-depth experiences uh go listen to episode 99 that episode is called life lost too soon and it's a roundtable discussion with jeff blau and sam on and uh i even talk a little bit about our experience with miscarriage uh before jake was born so i think that Mm -hmm. that's definitely um a story worth listening to no matter where you are in your parenting experience so right now, exactly. now let's jump into before mm-hmm. Baby On really came into your life. Mm-hmm. What did the process look like to start adoption? And how did you guys make the decision to adopt in South Korea? Sure. Um, so, yeah, for, for, the, ado- for the decision um, to adopt from South Korea, uh, I am of Korean ethnicity, uh, grew up with Korean parents, and... Um, that's kind of really the real reason why we decided that our first option would be from South Korea. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to have a child who, uh, shared, um, my ethnic background and, you know, we're hoping to see if we're able to adopt from the Philippines or someone with Philippine, um, cause my, my wife is Filipino. Um, so we're, hoping that we'll have an opportunity to maybe uh, adopt someone with a, a Filipino uh, ethnicity uh, next, but, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, adoption is really not for the faint of heart, um, especially international adoption, because it is a marathon of a process. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you need to be dedicated to. Um, and, so much is not in your control. Um, so it really is a test of your kind of um, emotional and mental uh, resilience, really, uh, when you're when you're adopting internationally. Just to give you all you know, an idea of when we started, you know, we actually started with a different agency than the one we eventually went with. Um, we started, we had our first inquiry with our first adoption agency fall of 2018. Uh, didn't turn out to be a right fit for us. So we actually switched to another different agency in fall of 2019. And this is the agency that we actually ended up going with. Um, our initial application was submitted, um, I think September of 2019. So more than two years ago, um, wow. from when we brought uh baby on home. So, you know, it, it really is a a labor of love um there's so much unknown you know it it, it's you have to understand that so much of the process is really out of your control so it's definitely not for the faint of heart uh could you talk about some of those tangible ups and downs that you guys had with the process sure absolutely um adoption from south korea there's a lot of hurdles and hoops you have to jump through you know, there's a lot of paperwork and basically by the time you're done with the actual like submission of papers, like there is no aspect of your life that, uh, is not known, um, from doing a full, uh, examination of our finances to psychological, uh, examinations from a a licensed psychologist to um reference letters of character from people who have known us 
to FBI and local background checks, there's really no part. Uh, I mean, we have a, we have a social worker come into our house and make sure the house itself is, you know, a good condition um, somewhere where a child can be raised. So uh, medical history. So there's there's nothing that will be hidden uh, when we submit our what they call a dossier um, to the Korean uh, agencies uh, for that adoption process. So, and I think that that would be a similar process. I mean, I know that you guys are only familiar with South Korea, but like, mm-hmm. I'm sure that that would be a similar process if people were to adopt domestically or perhaps other countries. Is that is that a fair assumption? I think so. I think it's. Um, I know Korea has a little bit more stringent guidelines because of the fact that um, there have been some bad experiences uh, with. Uh, adoptees from Korea. Um, so the Korean government has imposed a lot of extra steps. So I don't think uh, a psychological evaluation is required for domestic adoptions, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they'll they'll check like uh, child abuse history and oh. you know if that w- that exists. But you know, they don't actively do a psych exam. I don't believe. Um, but I do believe they do kind of go into some of the more in-depth stuff in terms of your background and your finances and all that. Wow. Dude, yeah, that, that, it, that's going through the ringer. It is definitely going through the ringer uh, at least twice. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, so you guys did one uh, adoption agency and then you went mm-hmm. with another one. So did you guys mm-hmm. so you guys had to do that twice or was there some of that that, transi- that transferred over? How did that work? No, yeah, we actually um, cut the process off with our first agency even before we uh, did what they what's called a home study. That's what it is. A uh, home study is when they study the home. Um, so, you know, it was during the uh, pre-application process we actually switched. So fortunately, we didn't have to do we didn't have to go through the ringer like more than two times. Uh, okay. Yeah, the, the two times with our second agency was was enough, uh, fortunately for us. Were there any moments where you were like, "Man, this is never going to go through"? Um, you know, it seems like that um, when you're kind of in the thick of it and you're really just, you know, wondering how many more papers you have to like, you know, sign and how many more copies that have to be notarized and all that. And like, it just seems like a never ending mountain of just administrative paperwork, but what a pain. it's such a pain, but you know, once it's done, it's, it's a really good feeling, but then you have the feeling of things really being out of your control at that point. Right. Right. Now yeah. let's talk about the moment that you actually decided to adopt your son. How does that work? Like, do they give sure. you a list of names, pictures, things like that, or or what happens? Yeah, that's so. That's a great question. Um, during the application process, um, parents are asked like what kind of health conditions or uh, developmental issues that they're they feel like they're prepared to handle. Um, so there's a lot of screening that happens on our end as well. Um, mm-hmm. And we were pretty open because kind of we we. Th- we went into it with the knowing that, you know, with Zoe having been born so early, you know, there were there is definitely a risk of some uh, developmental delays or issues. And, you know, we decided that, you know, if we were ready f- to take care of Zoe, we'd be ready to take care of another child who has who may have issues. So, you know, we were relatively open in terms of what we could deal with. Um, so. You know, we submit that and we actually don't get a choice in terms of a child. Um, The agency will match you. We can let them know that we have a preference for sex of the baby. Um, You know, whether it's a a child born as a male or a child born as a female. So, um, but we really had no preference. Um, So we didn't let, we let them know we don't have a preference. Um, so once we submitted all that paperwork, uh, we actually just get matched, uh, from the agency. The agency sends us a file of a child, um, with pictures, uh, kind of, uh, initial medical history, um, and kind of updates, medical and developmental updates to that point. And we basically have to, uh, take it, uh, within a week or so and, you know, do all the legwork of, checking with the doctor to see if there are any red flags in terms of medical issues. Um, and then we let them know that, yes, this is, we are, we are comfortable accepting this match, um, that, uh, of a child that they basically just say, here's, here's the child. Um, you know, with Korea, the only reason you can 
uh, decline a match is for medical reasons. So, um, you know, if there are no medical issues that are 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 to the level of turning down uh, the the match, then for the most part, you know, when when you get your when you get your referral, which is what it's called, when you get the referral packet from uh, your agency, that's that's the child that the universe has decided um, is going to be in your home. Yeah, and, and here you are. So, so when did you actually mm-hmm. get to meet your son? Yeah, so um, we actually met him for the first time when we went to Korea. Um, so the process basically was we received our referral in March. Um, we got a call on a Friday morning from our agency saying that there is a referral for us. And later that day, we got uh, his picture, we got his information, and from that point on, we knew his name, we knew who he was, and we knew what he looked like. Um, and at that point, we can start kind of sending care packages. Um, we can send like teddy bears and uh, books and stuff. And we sent pictures of ourself, ourselves, um, and our dog. But like you know, once we found out that he existed <laughs> in March, um, we still didn't get to meet him until uh, the first time uh, on August twenty twenty seventh uh, in Korea. This is going to be, by the way, this, what I'm about to ask is going to be a two parter. Yeah. One. Okay. Mm-hmm. What was it like getting mm-hmm. that picture and seeing your son for the first time in that mm-hmm. context? I don't know what I don't know how to describe it other than saying that it felt right. Um, like both of us saw his picture. We saw, you know, all of the information about him, but like, just, you know, it's that gut feeling. And I don't know if it's like a confirmation bias thing, but you know, something kind of both with both of us, like deep within our soul, like we knew that this kid was meant to be our son in terms of being able, being able to have the privilege of, you know, raising him, uh, to be a, a great person. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of think of it like that. You know, we feel like it's a privilege that we have him in our life. Um, and that's 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 the only way that I can really describe it. And then, you know, when we met him for the first time, it just, it's like a whole next level um, where you meet a kid for the first time and you're just like, oh my God. Like, I don't know how my life was before this very moment but everything changes and you know we we talk about love at first sight with like relationships but like this is truly like love at first sight like we saw him for the first time and we just both fell in love with him like Mm -hmm. he was such a great kid he's so happy and smart and so expressive and it felt like we were home i guess is kind of the best way the best way to put it. Well, like, you answered that second part of that question, by the way, it was going to be, what was it like when you actually met him? And that, that what you're talking about reminds me yeah. of, you know, meeting my two kids when they were born. Yeah. I'm sure it's the same feeling when, yeah. you know, you were able to see, you know, Francis and Zoe and, and those sorts mm-hmm. of ways too. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's unfathomable that, that feeling, but you yeah. know it when you feel it. That's yeah, the only way that exactly. I can explain it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's it's amazing. Like I don't know, and like you know, I feel like there's a lot definitely to be said about you know the moms at least, where you know you carry the child for nine months, and you know there's the there's a deeper bond there. But like I don't know what it is. Like it's it's almost like my brain just spontaneously re- rewired to like mm-hmm. just know that this kid is going to be the child who uh is part of our family and like you know we we would do anything to protect him that's you a know? serious paternal instinct that kicks in when you, yeah when you see your kid i i yeah. totally know exactly what you're talking about and now thinking about that time that you guys were in korea how how long did you actually spend in korea we arrived August 25th in, in Incheon, which is the airport where you, the main airport to get into Seoul. And, you know, because it's COVID right now and right. Korea takes COVID very seriously, um, we were concerned that we'd have to quarantine for two weeks. Uh, fortunately, uh, right before we were getting set to travel, the Korean government 
uh, decided that adopting a child is government business. So we were actually exempt from exempt from quarantining for two weeks. So we were able to get there on the 25th and we had our first meetings that first week, our court date. um, So you do have to do a court date uh, where you appear in court in front of a judge. Um, That was the first Friday of September. And then Korea has mandatory waiting periods built into the adoption process. So um, we had to wait a good uh, couple of days for the judge to provide public notice to the birth family. And then once that public notice is received by the birth family, then a two week uh, countdown begins where we literally just sit around just waiting for time to pass by. And after all that, we finally received custody uh, approval and custody uh, at the end of September, on September 30th. Uh, went to the U.S. Embassy the next day for his visa interview, uh, received his visa the same day, and then we flew out uh, the Monday after on October 4th. So wow. we were there for a good uh, six weeks or so. Yeah, almost two months. I've been following your all's journey, and the, yeah. it's, it was an amazing experience, by the way, just seeing the two of you go through that together and mm-hmm. uh, the, again, the dedication to each other and, and the love there is is amazing. How mm-hmm. did you guys do in Korea for, for a month and a half? I'm sure that you've <laughs> been there, uh, right? Or, or have you yeah. not? Uh, we've actually both been. Um, okay. I actually lived in Korea for a year, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, teaching English, and then she actually visited. It was when we were dating, so she visited me in Korea. So gotcha. um, that was the last time. Two thousand nine was the last time we were both in Korea. So it was, it's been a it's been a while, and it's changed a lot in the past yeah. twelve years. Um, it was a nice time of us kind of living our last few weeks as uh, parents, or I guess a married couple uh, without you know children. You know, we were both still working. Uh, fortunately, both of our uh, workplaces allowed us to continue working while we were in Korea so that we didn't have to use up uh, any parental leave or any uh, vacation time um, or great. too much vacation time. So, yeah, it was it was interesting to kind of be on a different schedule uh, because we were still t- keeping relatively East Coast time. Um, so we would wake up, um, do one or two things in the d- during the day, uh, and then come back. Uh, we were at an Airbnb for a month, um, so that's an experience. Yeah. A one bedroom, um, yeah. Uh, it's actually more of a studio with a kitchen. So yeah, that was an experience. And I think um, it, you know we were both joking that staying in a cramped Airbnb for a month, uh, if we could get through that without killing each other, um, I think our marriage is probably <laughs> in, in good shape. <laughs> Um, I mean, it was very close. It was very close quarters. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we 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 got through it. Um, the bed was uncomfortable. Uh, the shower was nice, but uh, it was just such a cramped space. And we were just crawling over our suitcases to get the things. And um, it was definitely not the most ideal situation, uh, but we got through it. And yeah, that I light think, at that end of the tunnel, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, our our relationship really actually um, got stronger, you know, during that month and a half or so that we were, we were just sitting around waiting. Um, Yeah. That's beautiful, man. And when you guys uh, got to meet your son, what was that bonding experience? Like, how did you guys start to build a relationship with him when, you know, to, to him, you guys were probably strangers and this is kind Mm -hmm. of a, a little bit of culture shock for him in some kind of ways too. Well, actually, so surprisingly, um, because we had sent photos, uh, the foster mother, uh, foster parents, actually, um, they were great. Oh, and awesome. they, yeah, they they told him um, who we were. Um, you know, they told him that we were mommy and daddy. Um, so anytime they asked where's mommy and daddy, he would run to the fridge and point to our picture. So oh, God, he knew great. us. Yeah, he knew us when he saw us for the first time. Um, the foster mom let us know that, you know, he's usually very wary of strangers and even cries when he meets strangers for the first time. But when we had our first meeting, uh, our first one hour meeting with him, he didn't cry. He was definitely not impressed with us, uh, cause he barely interacted with us. Um, but like, you know, it was, it was very, it was a very interesting kind of hour where, 
you know, we kind of all know each other, but like we didn't really interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the fact that he didn't cry uncontrollably, you know, when he first met us, I think that was a a good, good thing. And then we actually had another, we had a second meeting two days after and, uh, we actually played together for a little bit. Um, you know, he didn't, he still didn't like leave his foster mother. Um, he was still kind of like attached to her, but he still sort of ventured uh, a little closer to both of us and, uh, you know, interacted with us a little bit. And, you know, we, he, it took a little bit of time for him to warm up. Um, it usually takes him a good, like 45 minutes to an hour to warm up to someone new. Um, and we keep seeing that, you know, with like new friends at daycare or like my parents, um, our friends, like he kind of takes a little bit of time to warm up. And once he gets warmed up, he gets, you know, you see his, uh, his goofy, cheerful nature come out. And, uh, that's what, that's what we, uh, detected. Um, that's what we kind of saw when, when we interacted at the second meeting. No, oh, that's so, that's so yeah. cool, dude. And, yeah. and now I'm sure, well, are you able to share how old he was when you adopted him? Sure. Uh, we actually just missed his second birthday um, when we took custody. Uh, he he just turned two um, a couple of days before. Uh, so we had basically known of his uh, existence since he was uh, one and a half about. Um, yeah. And it was it was really cool to watch him kind of grow. Um, we, we, we got monthly updates, um, every month we got his latest measurements and a couple of pictures and some videos. Um, so it was really cool to watch him grow, um, yeah. little by little as, as we got the monthly updates and it was, it was such a joy. Yeah. Uh, we, we waited like, you know, with bated breath, like every, every last week of the month is when we got our updates. So, um, we would just sit around just refreshing our inboxes over and over again to Aww. see if we got the latest updates and you know when we get the latest updates like our day would be made we wouldn't be able to do work that day because we'd just be so over the moon just having the latest pictures of him and yeah it was it was uh getting to know was, this kid across the other side of the you know on the other side of yeah, the world there it's wild uh, it's so wild <laughs> you know uh that that age is very interesting um, because they're starting to learn social cues, mm-hmm. verbal communication, nonverbal communication. What has that been like for for both you and Elaine trying to bring him into now this, you know, kind of American culture where English is is a pretty prominent language here, and I'm sure you're still surrounding him with with, you know, your family where they're speaking Korean and everything as well, probably, but what what has that been like as far as his now immersion into American culture? So it's been interesting. Um, you know, he was born in 2019, right before the pandemic started, and Korea takes the pandemic much more seriously. So we actually figured out early on that he probably hasn't had much interaction with peers um, his age. Um, his foster family did have some school-aged children that he would see on occasion and interact with, but... You know, Korea doesn't really do, um, they're not doing a lot of uh, interaction publicly because they want to make sure their kids are protected. Um, So we kind of figured from early on that he probably didn't have much contact with kids his age. Um, So it's been, it's actually been interesting um, trying to, you know, see his developmental milestones. And, you know, he's actually slightly behind in terms of some of the milestones because um, just the lack of, real contact with you know children his age uh it's definitely taken a toll uh you know this pandemic's taken a toll on all of us but i think it's definitely taken a toll on the younger kids um we just started him in daycare and from what we've heard uh all of his peers kind of have similar issues in terms of not not being you know able to get to the development milestones when they're supposed to um but from what we also heard is once they start daycare you know, those developmental milestones get hit real quick. So they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've actually started seeing that, like, you know, when we, before we started daycare this week, anytime we took him to the playground, he didn't really do the parallel play stuff. Like he would watch, but not really emulate. Um, now that we've, now that we've had him in daycare, you know, we've kind of, you know, sneaked by his daycare when they're doing the playground and we've watched him interacting with kids and doing parallel plays. So, 
you know, it's amazing how much he's changed in the past week, honestly. Um, first day of daycare was this past Monday. And um, by Thursday, he was there the whole day. Um, didn't cry, didn't look for us, uh, for better or worse, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, like, just the way he's communicating with us has changed. Um, he's picked up English real fast. It, like, you know, he's not very expressive verbally yet, but he definitely understands a lot of what we're saying um and he's picked up just based on i mean i don't even know like cognitively how it happens but like he really does understand a lot of what we're saying and when we ask him to do simple things like you know take take buzz lightyear to mommy like he knows to take the buzz lightyear from his toy bin and go to the other room where mommy is and give it to her that's great um so like it, it's been amazing to see how quickly two-year-olds pick pick they, they do and, and that yeah. by the way that comment about um about daycare is so real we started yeah. aria at daycare when mm-hmm. she was i don't know about three and mm-hmm. she ended up um you know because she was only hanging out with like maybe her cousins or yeah um our moms like stuff like that so she had a very small group of of people that mm-hmm. she was interacting with her social skills increased her 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 vocal ability everything everything skyrocketed when she started interacting with a broader set of peers right so exactly. it, and i and i get that you know a lot of people like it's super expensive right like daycare yeah. oh my gosh absurd yeah. but at the same time like if you can afford it i'm a big proponent like even if oh. you don't need it if you have the parents in, in town like deanna and i do it's so mm-hmm. worth it like we're gonna start jacob mm-hmm. um jake is gonna start in daycare here soon Mm-hmm. Uh, because Arya is starting kindergarten soon, which is freaking Oof, weird. My goodness, right? No, so, she, I, I did. I did not realize they let three year olds in kindergarten. That's wild. Oh, oh, yeah. It, uh, in fact, she's actually closer to five. So oh, that's, <laughs> she, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> freaking time not, flies. She is not five. You are lying. You lie. Not sir. lying. Two thousand seventeen. <laughs> Man, that seems like yesterday. Isn't it weird? So, so she weird. she she's gonna start up in kindergarten, and we're gonna put Jake in in daycare because if you try to foot two daycare bills at the same time, it's brutal. Oh yeah. Um, but with that said, you know, like you find a, a good daycare that works really well for you, for your family, yeah. what you're comfortable mm-hmm. with, and yeah. it does it pays dividends. Man, yeah. it's incredible. So highly highly recommend that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, th- th- and this is this is so fantastic. First of all, that you guys have come from you know such a long way from this really tragic experience becoming first time parents mm-hmm. to now continuing to to be tenacious working through the the obscurity in a lot of ways around mm-hmm. adoption and then seeing this light at the end of the tunnel and now having your son at home yeah. what is life like at home now in the on household it's always messy <laughs> yeah um and it's also a very joy filled house. Um, like he brings so much joy into our life. Even, even though he has his two year old tantrums about the most, of course, to us trivial things like the joyful times where he's laughing and playing and giggling, asking for hugs and kisses and snuggling Mm -hmm. and story time, like all of that, like watching him discover new things our house is filled with so much joy these days. And like, I would not, we would not trade anything for it, for the joy that we have experienced in our life for the past, uh, past two months. Um, it's indescribable, like how much our household has changed. And it feels like there is life in the household. Um, we were just remarking that, our family room, which was previously just kind of an empty room with nothing in it, now is just constantly messy, filled with toys. But like, it, it's definitely the warmest room in our house now, and Aww. there are going to be so many amazing memories made in that room um, for for many years to come. So we are yeah. we're so happy, um, we're so excited to to have uh, a beautiful, smart. Um, charismatic hilarious uh child uh in our life now it's the best dude it's it seriously is. it's the best 
It's the best. Yeah. Well, there's if there's anybody that deserves to be parents, it's you guys with everything you've been through, the love that you guys have uh, to, to share. I'm so happy to be on this side of this conversation with you. So, Absolutely. so happy. And now you we, and me both. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we, we talked about a lot, like we talked about that entire process, the adoption, uh, meeting your son to where you are today in a happy home, you know, with anybody else out there listening who may be going through something similar. And we always like to end this show on with some words of wisdom. What would you tell somebody who's perhaps going through the adoption process or thinking about it today uh, based on the lessons that you've learned over the past few years? Adoption is a journey. Um, you've probably heard that if you're in the process or have uh, been exploring the process, you've probably heard that already. Uh, and you know that adoption is a journey. Um, it's definitely not the easiest journey in the world. And there will be moments where you'll ask yourself, um, is it worth it? You know, when you're, when you're on, when you're on your third copy of your 401k statement and your mortgage statement, and you're wondering how much more paperwork do we need to print out? How many more trees do we have to kill Yeah, <laughs> for the paperwork? Um, push through it and, you know, your patience, your, um, your steadfast dedication to bringing your child home, uh, will all be worth it. Um, it's going to be difficult. And those first couple of days and weeks are going to be some of the hardest in your life once you bring your child home. But it's, it's a blip in the grand scheme of things. Totally. Um, once your child is home and you are loving on that child with all your heart. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to ask, do you know of any I don't know, resources or were there any books or websites or communities that you guys joined as you guys were preparing for adoption that might be valuable to the listeners? Yeah. Um, we actually have a lot of friends who have adopted. Um, and you know, honestly the best resources for us as we were starting the process were our friends who have adopted. So definitely ask around your, your circle of friends. Um, if you know of people who have adopted, uh, definitely ask around and see, um, there are a lot of adoption agencies out there. Uh, some are better than others. Um, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, most adoptive parents will be more than happy to share their experience. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the resources that we also received specifically to Korean adoption was on Facebook. Honestly, uh, there's a lot of social media groups have allowed social media has allowed parents to really connect with each other. And it, you know, it, it was really helpful to meet people who are along the, on our journey. So don't be, don't be afraid to reach out, um, to people who have been through the process to people who, um, are in the process right now. Um, because those are really the best, uh, resources for you and everyone has a favorite book and everyone has a favorite resource but you know the more information you can get uh the better and of course once you've once you've picked an agency don't hesitate to uh make your social workers uh, earn their keep because totally. they really they really are there uh to be a resource for you um and I think a lot of times we're hesitant because we don't want to be in imposition, but they are more than happy to jump at the opportunity to to help out a family. So oh, totally. And I could imagine that's, that they that's what they're, you know, like that's why they do what they do. They they want exactly. to be that resource too. Right. You know? Yep. Exactly. So yeah, just anyone, just feel free to ask, ask any of your friends. I know uh we would also be if you are specifically looking for Korean adoption, um, just let us know and we are also happy to be a resource for you. Yeah, totally. And if it makes sense, you can email the dad chronicle podcast at gmail.com. And I could always, you know, play that sort of middleman, if you will, to, yep, to get absolutely. in touch. So, uh, again, our guest has been Sam on again, it's been a huge pleasure, man. Thanks so much for sharing your story. And, and I'm so happy again to be on this conversation with you. This is great. Thank you so much. It was a great time to catch up and chat with you. Huge thank you to Sam for sharing his story. I can't imagine going through what he went through. He and Elaine are a great example of tenacity through the parenting process and coming out on the other side of this with so much love and goodness. So, so happy to 
have him on the show and to share his story. And if you'd like to comment on anything that you heard today or learn a little bit more about some of the resources that Sam was talking about, you can email the Dad Chronicle podcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support what we're doing here, you can become a patron. Head to supportadad.com and find a level that works for you. Even $1 a month helps tremendously towards the operational costs of this show. Thanks for listening. And remember, be good to yourself, be good to others, and we'll see you next time. If you like this show, check out more great content at incastmedianetwork.com.